I do not like to preach what I call doomsday sermons. And wouldn't you know I wrote one this morning, a doomsday sermon that I don't want you to look at as a doomsday sermon. I don't want to dwell on hell, I want to dwell on hell. It comes from Isaiah chapter 55 and Luke in chapter 13. You'll find those references on your outline sheet. And I call it sin's sweet music, because that's what sin does to us. It weaves a sweet music and a lure that makes us want to sin more. In the early years of England's desire to rule the world, and that this is that based on that idea of the sun never sets on the British Empire kind of thinking, there were more ships than there were sailors. Now something had to be done. So because of the manpower shortage on British ships, the captains were authorized to practice what was called conscription. And every port they got to, if they found a lone man or two off to one side, they'd simply hustle him on board ship, chain him up till they left the harbor, and he now worked for the British Empire. We'd call it kidnapping, but back then they had to have a polite term, so they called it conscription. What the sea captains could not do is get these people to quit their grouching because they would complain about their families that were left behind. They would complain about not having enough to eat. They were constantly complaining, so the sea captains had to do something special. So what they did was they would load lotus plants onto the ships and they would have these new inductees eat lotus plants and the lotus plants contain an opiate and that calmed the soul. In fact, it made drug addicts out of these new sailors and they quit their grouching. Okay? This dulling effect is really a sad footnote to history. But Lord Alfred Tennyson happened to write a poem about it that I found, and it's called a Coric, C-H-O-R-I-C, a Coric poem, and it's beautiful words about a very ugly practice. Here it is. There is sweet music that softer falls than petals from blown roses on the grass, or night dews on still waters between walls of shadowy granite in a gleaming pass. Music that gentler on the spirit lies than tired eyelids upon tired eyes. Music that brings sweet sleep down from the blissful skies here are cool mosses deep. And through the moss, the ivy creeps, and the stream, in the stream, the long-leaved flowers weep, and from the craggy ledge, the poppy hangs in sleep, <laughs> directed exactly at this conscription by, by the British sailors. I speak of America here when I say vast numbers of men and women have also been lulled in this lethargy, if you will, towards their spiritual condition, just as those sailors were lulled past caring by the poppy plant, the lotus plant. In America, drugs themselves do play a part. I can't count the number of people I visited in our jails. And they were on drugs. They all want two things. Preacher, do you have $20 and can you get me out of here? Okay, no, no, and no. You have to pay the price. So drugs do play a part, and they do give a non-caring attitude to people. I've seen children abandoned. I will not relate to you some of the tales I have lived through, but I can tell you that I've seen children treated so horribly 
that it would dwell on my mind for months and months afterwards. It's my consideration that that's not all that America suffers from. It makes the big headlines, but that's not all that America suffers from. Our problems are deeper than just drugs. We have moral laxity in this land. We have spiritual indifference. I cannot count the number of people, really way beyond counting from my point of view over all these years that I have invited to church and I'll let me clean the answers up and basically they said, I don't think so, okay? <laughs> I don't think so. Spiritual indifference, moral laxity, a blindness, if you will, for the obsession of public approval instead of God's approval. Too many lotus plants of public indifference are aimed at making everything legal from marriage contracts that are wrong to public nudity that is wrong to religious approval of killing infidels when in effect if Jesus had wanted to kill infidels he sure was quiet about it staying nailed to the cross. Let's make it all legal and that'll make it all right. Anybody watch the Oscars besides me? Let me put that differently. Was anybody besides me forced to watch the Oscars? <laughs> so I watched it too. Do you remember what they had there? Called the red carpet. Anybody know why the carpet was red? Because of what some of those people weren't wearing, they had to be embarrassed. <laughs> they had to have the red carpet to hide it behind. It was awful in some ways, okay? In other <laughs> ways, it's normal, entirely normal. We have allowed this to happen in this great nation of ours and to turn the truths of God, if you will, and his plan for us into a sad parallel of our basic freedoms. Listen, I'll give you a good example of this. We used to have the original ability when this country was first formed to speak out against any practice that we felt was not right with God. You want something really neat to read? Read the presidential debates. Read them, okay? Read them from, oh, starting about 1800 and up, okay? I mean, when they said it, they said it point blank in black and white when they doubt. Nowadays you let that happen and somebody will rise up and say we ought to put that candidate in prison because they're violating the rights of other people. I'll tell you what, if you do this today and speak out against certain practices and things, you will be charged with a hate crime by your very own government. God hates sin, so what's next? Think we ought to sue God in court? <laughs> a lot of people would think that. I cite as proof those ministers in Albuquerque. The lawyer of the city of Albuquerque demanded copies of their sermons because they had preached against practices that had been preached against by preachers since the dawn of creation of time. And the whole thing sounds terribly false. Very incorrect, according to the mayor of the city. What was the topic of all this particular hoopla out there? Well, the real meaning of the marriage contract. According to the Bible, that's being a tie between one man and one woman. By the way, isn't Mississippi going through this right now with their, with their chief justice agreeing with what marriage is, the same way that we would think of marriage? My wife and I are not the same sex. If God had wanted it to be that way, wouldn't he have put two Adams in the Garden of Eden and we'd have had short-lived human history, wouldn't we? But you let one judge in Mississippi speak out against this and our own president comes on and says federal laws always trump state laws. We're hedging our bets. We're hedging our bets. In my mind, this goes against God's wishes. Come on. 
It's the way things are. So what's our greatest need in America today? A better welfare program? To okay going ahead, doing anything you want? Trump all the local laws with federal statutes and mandates? Anything goes, fire the government? Listen, it doesn't work. I just think remember about 24 years ago when we fired the whole Senate and House of Representatives put a whole new slate in. Guess what? Business went on as usual. Everybody got in office, they looked at their budget and they said, my goodness, we've got lots of taxpayer money, let's spend double that so we'll always run a deficit. Okay. To me, I thought a long time about this. To me, I believe, and it ought to be to you too, that the greatest need in this nation is an awareness of the sins they're committing and their repentance <coughs> to God for doing it. Repentance is the need. I offer for your consideration these next two verses of Scripture as the main topic of today's sermon. I'm in Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek the Lord. Get this part here because it's part of our next part of the sermon. While he may be found, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. The evil man has thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. Or Psalm 145, 18. The Lord is nigh unto all of them that call upon him. Did God force his way into your life? Now you think about this. Did God force his way into your life? Did, did he grab you by the collar, haul you up short, and say, you will belong to me or else? Remember Revelations? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anybody's going to hear my voice. They will open the door, and then I'll go in and talk with them, have dinner with them, we'll, we'll be friends, but not before they have to open the door. You know why I'm pushing this today? Because God will not always be with us. Think that's not true? <coughs> Genesis 6 3. My spirit will not contend with humans forever. Or 1 Samuel 3 1. I preached on this about uh, six weeks ago. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Why? Number one, Eli was a really old guy. Okay? And number two, Samuel was just a little kid serving Eli in the temple. So we didn't have all kinds of priests and seers and so on. And the visions of the Lord were rare because they always came through the temple back then. Damn. The first problem lies with each one of us. In Hebrews 3.13, the Bible says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sins, deceitfulness, your own sins can make you immune to the voice of God. That's not unusual. When you get into your sinning habits, then you get hardened in your heart and things begin to be okay, even if the carpet is red. Mm. We begin to okay things that we wouldn't okay. You know what we say about things like that? Well, at least they weren't naked. Thank you. We've made an automatic excuse. We've made an automatic excuse. Sin is a cinch by the inch, and it sings a sweet music over all things. Sin actually blinds us to God's love, and the second problem <coughs> lies with God himself. Remember what I read earlier, Genesis 6-3, my spirit will not always contend with humans forever for any of us to always say God forgives that sounds so good in fact wasn't there a song a few years uh, about uh, one of the ending verses in the chorus was 
and God forgives. And it was always sung out with a fanfare. That's, that sounds so good, and it's terribly bad theology. It's terribly bad theology. God's finally had enough of things, and he calls a halt to them. Let me take you back to Numbers 16. Numbers chapter 16 in the Bible. The towns of Dathan and Abiram were swallowed up in an earthquake. 250 town leaders were consumed by fire, and 14,700 people died in a plague. Why? Because God stepped up. This is true. God steps up. I assume God's toes are like mine, and he draws a line in the sand. And he says, you step over that line, and I will consume you. And they did, and God said, you step over that line and I will consume you. And they did. And God said, you step over that line and I will consume you. And they did and he did. God wanted to save souls. They refused to be saved. Don't make God run out of patience. That's a very dangerous thing to do in any religion that uses God and Jesus Christ as the keynotes of salvation. Repentance is urgent for us and for our nation. Don't answer this by raising your hands. How many of you are sinners? Welcome to the club. Okay. Kel, was I a good boy this week? Pretty good. <laughs> that, that's a qualifying statement. I was pretty good. I didn't cry. I didn't throw anything. No. Okay. I didn't even object when those two twenties were missing out of my wallet, did I? <laughs> I'm used to that. I go in a store just sure. I got forty bucks, and I look in there, and there's a dollar and a half left. Oh, what else is me? Okay. Don't make God run out of patience. And I think sometimes we're close. I think this is what brings us to the brink of disaster. Sin is a serious offense to God at all times. What does it say in Romans 6, 23? The wages of sin? It's death. Death. The wages of sin is death. Not life. Life's too short as it is. Yesterday we changed diapers and today we're changing bifocals. It seems to me to be something wrong with that. It's called the aging process. And God help us, we're all going through it. Life's too short. Just yesterday, we were talking about living in a trailer in Carbondale. Oh, it was hot, didn't have any air conditioning. It must have been 140 degrees that summer. Okay. Job 14, one and two. Man that is born of a woman is a few days and is full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continues not. How do you continue forever? And the answer is, I came here to be renewed, didn't you? Concentrate on heaven. I didn't come here to be barked at me just because I'm a sinner. I came here to be reminded that I'm a sinner so I can beg God's forgiveness and continue His pathway. My wife reminds me. Listen, all people will live in eternity. Now there's a great deal of theological argument about this, about being cast into the lake of fire. But that doesn't mean they die, that's just where they're cast for the final run. All people live in eternity. It's not the choice of just heaven or hell. The choice is where you're going to spend it. <laughs> I don't want to spend eternity in hell. I've had that described to me by a man that I felt was telling the absolute God's truth when he had been taken to hell and shown that place and come back so he could tell others. He said, my job's to tell others. And he described it in such livid, ugly detail. I said, what's the worst thing about it? He said, the smell, the stink of the burning flesh. He said, they burn, but they don't disappear. 
1 Peter 3, 8. One day with the Lord, that's a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day, and I put to you that God's time is not the same as our time, and God's counting it down. Should this church be full? Mind you, I appreciate you being here today. <laughs> We've got some ice and snow out there, but should the church be full? Every church that preaches Christ ought to be full. <laughs> Of course it should be. The third re reason for our continued repentance in God right now is that Jesus' return is imminent. Matthew 24, 36, of that hour and that day, no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only, only one that knows when this is going to happen. I can point out to you time after time after time going through this Bible where God got fed up with people and simply chopped it off. And finally he did what he had to do and he said, okay, I'll give you the ultimate sacrifice. Believe in him, you'll live forever. Deny him and you won't. I think all of us here have lived enough lives in Christ over time to be able to say that, you know, at least 13, 14 lifetimes have been expended here in believing in Jesus. Are we the ones that have the problems? Well, yeah, from time to time. But the real people that have the problems are the people we fail to tell. Really, that's true. No wonder we here and others out there not in Christ, they need to repent. Can you give up your sinful status? I think we're trying. I really think we try. But I am what I am. I was born contentious. My parents will vouch for that over all the years. Okay. And I'm still contentious. I make my plans and not God's plans all too often. And I think we all do that. Very much so. Some things really bother me. Children that have been harmed almost beyond repair and people who would harm them eat my heart out like a sieve with holes all over it. People who would harm those who are weaker than they are. Even with the elderly being punished by some relative that simply doesn't care or he doesn't have any patience with them. Wives that get beaten by their husbands and yes, I've got two people now I'm talking to where it's the other way around <laughs> and I think it's sad. What's our greatest goal? To love one another, heart, mind, and soul, and to love our God without question, heart, mind, and soul. Because Jesus taught us love. Amen. 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 May God bless each one of you. It came at a time when ice and snow were on the ground. <laughs> Be careful. I don't think that it's any worse now, but it's so easy to fall. Okay. Let us take our hymnals, turn to page 369, first and last verses. <clears throat>
God and Father in heaven, your blessing upon us. Dismiss us, Father, full of Christ the Holy Spirit, guided in the pathway of Jesus, and return us to worship another day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.